Good, good morning and welcome to the 33rd meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you all please to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, but Stuart Stevenson will have to leave during this committee session to attend another committee. The first agenda item is the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Um, this evidence session is with the organisations with economic interests. Can I just first of all welcome the, Gary Clark, the Development Manager of East of Scotland Federation of Small Businesses, Matt Lancashire, the Director of Policy and Public Affairs, Scottish Council for the De Development and Industry, Margaret Simpson, Scottish Borders Social Enterprise Chamber, and Norma Hart, Chief Executive Officer, Third Sector, Dumfries and Galloway. Um, you are probably all given evidence at committee at this or at committees before. Just to remind you, you don't have to touch any buttons on your speakers. They will be activated for you. And if you want to come in, just try and catch my eye. I try and uh, give a, a subtle wiggle of the pen if I think you're extending your answers beyond a, um, beyond a reasonable time. Uh, the pen has never flown out of my hands yet in the direction of the person if they don't stop, so I hope we can continue that. So, welcome, and uh, the first questions uh, this morning uh, from the committee uh, come from, I think it is, uh, who's that? Mike. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, this is a question for, for you, all, all the panel, really. What are your aspirations for the economy of the south of Scotland? How should the area look in, let's say, 10 to 20 years' time? And what needs to be done for the area to reach its full potential? What's your vision for 10 to 20 years' time? Who would like to start off with that? By the way, the, the other danger is, is if you all look away, then I nominate somebody. Um, so, so please don't, please don't. Gary, why don't you start with that? Yeah, off with, with this. Um, yeah, I, I think um, to some extent our aspirations for the south of Scotland are pretty similar to that for the rest of Scotland, and we want businesses uh, in the south to be supported as businesses in the rest of Scotland ought to be as well. However, we do have to recognise that the south of Scotland does have particular uh, business and economic uh, needs, uh, which are different to other parts of, of Scotland. Um, there's been a lot of comparison within, uh, for example, between the prospect of a south of Scotland enterprise and Highlands and Islands enterprise, but we would see quite radical differences between the, the north of the country and the south of the country. Uh, um, there are greater ties with other parts. So there's no central nexus like Inverness to, to anchor a Highlands and Islands uh, enterprise. Um, so in the south, you've got the borders quite reliant on Edinburgh to some extent and within 50 minutes train journey, uh, or much of the borders is now anyway. Um, in the southwest, more remote, uh, different challenges uh, there, for example, between places like Dumfries uh, and Stranraer. So I think for our point of view, we would want to look at the businesses in the south and we'd want a new agency to be able to look at what those businesses need specifically and address the needs of those businesses, not take a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, this is the great advantage and opportunity I think we have in the south of Scotland that we can look at the particular needs of businesses there, geographical, sectoral, uh, and really address those in a way that fits with the businesses themselves. Uh, Matt, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, it's just a follow on really from, from, from Gary, uh, as you'd expect here. But um, I think the aspiration for the South of Scotland is that we ensure that it grows over the next 10, 15, 20 years in terms of an inclusive, sustainable economy. Presently, we, we know there is an issue with productivity across the south of Scotland. We know there are many challenges, economic challenges, to do with wages, to do with housing and other aspects that all drive economic development in, in the region itself. But to over overcome those challenges and find the opportunities within them as well, we need the agency to span across public, private and third sectors in particular to find those opportunities to drive it forward. So. The agency is itself, the aspiration is, is that it can support a breadth of organisations, not just the private sector, not just the SMEs, not some of the large corporates in the area, but some of the social enterprises, the third sectors that all generate economic growth within a particular region or particular area as well. Um, in 10, 15, 20 years' time, 
we want to see the dial changed on productivity in the south of Scotland because I think that's the key aspect. If, we, if the agency can support us achieving that, that'll be a success in itself. We can bring that back into line with the rest of Scotland. If we can bring wages back into line with the rest of Scotland, we therefore have had a success and we've got economic inclusive growth that we can drive forward. So our aspiration is growth and our aspiration is growth for all within the region. Margaret, you, you were nodding furiously at moments then. Do you, do you want to add something to that? No, I just I totally agree with that. I, I'm a great believer in we need to build the capacity of the region itself from the bottom up and not just... Um, this is a great opportunity to make the, the whole of the borders more competitive with the rest of the country. We've fallen behind, as we say, on wages, on opportunities. Our young people leave and we need them to stay in the borders. We need to develop the skill base. Um, we've been looking at... Um, our sector generates 60 million and 1,200 full-time equivalent jobs, and yet the support that we get is minimal to be able to make the changes that we would love to see and create the wealth and that we need for the borders. We should be looking at research and development, computer coding, 3D print, bringing things in that will allow us to compete. We're only an hour away from Edinburgh, the same from the north of England. We need to make those connections better. OK. Stuart, you wanted to, I think, uh, tackle Gary on a particular point. Uh, Norma, I'll bring you in if you'd like to come in. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up... I'm just looking at the bill, because at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a bill. And the bill describes the aims, and section two of uh, subsection 2 of section 5, it gives a long list. What's missing from it, I just wonder if you'd like to comment, particularly uh, Gary Clark, it doesn't say anything about small and medium-sized enterprises. It, it specifically says promoting commercial and industrial, and then it says supporting community organisations, but it doesn't say anything about uh, what Matt referred to, social enterprises, and it doesn't say anything specific about small and medium-sized enterprises. Given the nature of the challenge in the south of Scotland, and I believe the predominance of SMEs as an economic contributor, should the aims of the enterprise as expressed in the bill be extended to cover those specific points, if, if only to balance the specific things that are mentioned? Yeah, I think that's a fair point to make because uh, if you look at the economy of the south of Scotland, uh, you know, the borders, for example, more than 50% of the workforce in the borders are employed by small businesses. Uh, that's not the case in other parts of Scotland. You can move into Central Belt, you know, somewhere like West Lothian, only 25% is, is small businesses. The rest is made up of large businesses. So that's the point I was making really at the outset and saying that we need to address the specific uh, needs of the south of Scotland. Um, Borders is very reliant on small businesses for employment. Dumfries and Galloway likewise. Dumfries and Galloway actually is the only area of Scotland that's seen a, a decrease in the number of businesses by about 2%, uh, according to the, the, the last round of, of figures. So there's very specific challenges uh, there, and we need to look at the scale of businesses in those areas. We need to look at the sectoral approach of a New South of Scotland uh, agency, because certainly the account managed key sectors uh, that SE have are not necessarily uh, what will drive that growth and productivity uh, that we want to see in the south of Scotland. So um, we, we'd certainly welcome a focus on that, but I think it is important that we support all businesses there, but recognising the specifics and, and yes, small businesses that are a huge part of the local economy in the south. Okay. Norma, you wanted to come in. So. I did, yes. Um, in answer to your question, <clears throat> the original question about the aspirations, I think we would want to see a younger, wealthier, better connected set of communities in the south of Scotland. I think also, uh, to, not to add to what's already been said rather than repeat it, I think there's some important questions to ask around the towns and, and small communities across the south of Scotland, which are um, fragile, they're very fragile, and it would be great to see them turning into thriving centres of small communities. Um, 
if I were to uh, be able to wa wave a magic wand, I would say that what we really need is um, to start thinking in an integrated way about our economy and not to think about businesses separately from social enterprises, separately from communities and community-based organisations and start to think about um, place-based regeneration, which is very much where the bill is going. And certainly we in the third sector welcome that. Thank you. Mike? Yeah. Um, do you think, therefore, then, having, having listened to your responses, that um, Scottish enterprise doesn't really or hasn't recognised in the way that you'd like it to have done the strengths and assets of the south of Scotland and that your own... I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it the, is it the case that you think, think that a new agency for the south of Scotland would actually be able to much, do a much better job than what Scottish enterprise have been doing? Um, and, why, and why? Right. Uh, Norma, you, you seem to be happy to, to, to maybe lead the charge on that one. <laughs> well, so. I, I think that's what's known as a leading question. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> and um, I would want to be critical of, the, of uh, di directly critical of Scottish enterprise. I do think um, it's been constrained by its powers. And one of the very positive things about the bill is that it brings in a, a new model based on Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which certainly we in the third sector welcome, because it's an opportunity to look at uh, to look at communities and, and regeneration of our uh, economy and our area in a different way. The place-based approach is extremely welcome. A, a very adroit answer, if I may say so. Who, who would like to, Matt? You'd like to? <clears throat> I think we, we've got to not look at them as competing or combative entities as such. I, I think for the South of Scotland agency, new agency to work, it needs to work with Scottish enterprise to be more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So the South of Scotland agency in itself, we, we obviously want it to succeed with the business base, the placemaking, all the stuff that we just talked about just then. But also, we want it to be able to connect into other opportunities that exist without, out with the region. So we talk about 3D printing Im imaging, we talk about renewables, etc. Well, that's only going to be achieved if the region connects beyond its boundaries into the north of England, into the central belt, and internationally as well. And the South of Scotland agency play a role in that, but of course so do Scottish Enterprise. So there needs to be a link in terms of conversations uh, around that and rather than be a combative relationship it needs to be one of partnership and collaboration to move things forward because both bring opportunities to the region okay gary yeah i, I think that's absolutely right i mean it's, it's not a case of scottish enterprise versus south of scotland enterprise it's about what additionality uh, south of scotland enterprise could bring to the equation um scottish enterprise nas nationally has a a national focus and focuses in on the, the, the key sectors that drive the Scottish economy as a whole. If you're looking at the south of Scotland, you know, we have sectors like agriculture, forestry, um, tourism is obviously a, a, a key sector there as well, but uh, there are sectors that are quite particular to that part of the country and which probably need uh, or would, um, would benefit from greater local focus. Uh, and greater local resources being brought to bear to support the businesses in those areas. So we'd certainly be looking for additionality. We'd be looking for the South of Scotland Enterprise uh, Agency to um, to link very closely with SE, to link very closely with, with existing services, uh, whether that's Business Gateway, um, SDS, uh, all of those services locally. We're looking for it to bring additionality. Um, John, do you want to sort of bring in one or two of the points you wanted yeah, to bring in. Yeah, good morning, panel. And, and I know you're all being very diplomatic and not wanting to be critical of Scottish enterprise. I, I represent the Highlands and Islands constituency, and Highlands and Islands enterprise has, uh, cons uh, who I have been critical of for their, their, their performance. Um, they've given many uh, organisations more than the sum that uh, Scottish enterprise have allocated to business headquarters in the south of Scotland in the last two years. Scottish Enterprise, we are told, between three and five million. These are very, very modest sums. Scottish Enterprise also gave two million to Lockheed Martin, the, 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 the most profitable arms company in the world, just uh, a matter of two years ago. So, 
I appreciate you don't want to comment that, but comment on that, but I think it's important that's on the record. And if we're talking about start-up rates, surely that must impact uh, on the, the level of start-up rates or the dearth of start-ups. Margaret, would you like to comment? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I am going to criticise slightly. We don't see very much of Scottish enterprise in, in my sector um, because most of the firms that are small organisations, they're under five employees, so they, to the threshold that they need to be the account managed, they don't hit those targets when they need the investment. That's what I would like to see moving forward, much more flexible and support at that level so that we can really develop the skills and get places for our, our young people and indeed our older people. Yesterday we just heard that unemployment's back up by 11% in the borders for our young people again. So we're, we don't want more of the same. I, I really do hope that this is the innovation that I hope it will be moving forward. And I will hold it to account. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say that. Oh, right, and Norma. Uh, comment on that, particularly on the level of start-ups, please. Norma wants to come in. Well, I, I and sorry, yeah, Norma, and then we'll come to Matt. I, I want, wanted to add to what Margaret just said, more in terms of um, not so much about the, the start-up point, but that Scottish Enterprise, like many um, central belt-based agencies in Scotland um, doesn't, may not have the grip on and an understanding on rural issues that we at, at the local level have. So for example, in uh, Dumfries and Galloway, uh, you're probably aware, Pinney's uh, recently closed in Annan, creating uh, 450 job losses. Now that's the equivalent uh, in, in Glasgow of losing 4,000 jobs. And, and to, 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 to draw that out a little bit further, um, the place-based approach is so important because it allows uh, agencies like myself, like Scottish Enterprise, and hopefully this new enterprise agency, to look at a community and consider the loss of small numbers of jobs here and there, and to see them as a, as a collective group, as a whole, and to be able to respond to, that, to, to those job losses in a, in a strategic way. Now, to do that, you have to have local understanding and a grasp of what is happening with very small micro-businesses and small businesses. Otherwise, you, you're just painting over the, over the cracks, as it were. Matt, sorry. Uh, thank you, okay, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll keep this brief. I, obviously, there needs to be support for business startups in, in, in the south of Scotland. Uh, arguments can be made back and forth whether until now, it, has it been enough or not? And I'm, and I'm not going to comment on that. But I, I think we have to look beyond... Comment on that, because, uh, we're, because we're I, don't know, to... I, don't, I don't know the, the figures right in front of me, so it would be unfair of me to comment on that. But I, I can't see the official, official figures myself and look at that. But in terms of business start-up, yeah, more support needs to be given, but we need to look beyond that about scale-up. So that's how you keep people in an area. That's how you support investment in housing. That's how you support investment in transport links because people are attracted to the area because they see businesses scale up, that they see them draw people from afar, return us back from in, back who've left the south of Scotland back into the area, people with a skill base that is different to the current skill base there. One of the biggest critical issues that the south of Scotland needs to focus on is its demography in terms of its ageing population, but also the population by 2030 is suggested to reduce by 5%. So how do we attract people back into, into the south of Scotland? How does the new agency support that? Well, business start-up is one route. But scale up offers more jobs, more investment, and more people potentially returning to the area. So our focus needs to be twofold, not just business start-up. Thank you. Perhaps before Gary answers that first point there, can you also, and, and it's picking up on the point that Matt made there, not just about attracting, but the retention of young people, because that's a, a key factor as well, please. I, I, absolutely, it, it, it is. And it, it's not all down to, to, to Scottish Enterprise. It's Business Gateway are, are responsible for, for supporting a lot of the, the startups in, in the south of Scotland. And, uh, you know, but it's not, you know, it's not entirely within their gift to just increase the startup rate. We know that the startup rate in the south of Scotland is running, it's an increase of about two percent, whereas in the rest of Scotland it's been about ten percent. So it's running far behind 
uh, the rest of, of the country. Um, and rural areas generally have, have, have had that, that sort of level, and it is to do with demogra demographics and population, um, as Matt has said. Um, yeah, we need to do more to, to, to anchor uh, young people in particular in, in the south, um, create the opportunities uh, for them to uh, start up their own businesses or to work in local businesses. So, um, so yeah, it's a big challenge ahead, um, but it involves a, many, a great many agencies, for example, Business Gateway, Skills Development Scotland, the colleges, um, the councils. Uh, you know, there's a lot of players involved in trying to push that forward. Thank you. Do any other panel members want to comment on the retention of young people? Any specifics for that? Norma, go for it. Norma. Thank you. Um, clearly one of the biggest challenges we face. And uh, despite the very good school results that we get in the from the local education system, but uh, a good, the, the, the good quality um, results and the people who get them, they, they leave the area for higher education and other job opportunities. And then because they've gone, it, it creates a skills gap with those who remain, who are not necessarily trained, uh, trained up uh, to, uh, for, the, for the jobs that there are in the region. So I think addressing that skills gap for the new agency and all the other um, agencies that can make a contribution, like Skills Development Scotland and so on, and the local colleges. Uh, the other thing I, I think that is interesting to ask, though, is why do so many stay? Because they don't all leave. Some young people do stay. And there is, in my view, something's changing in in the, the region over the last, say, five or ten years. There's there's a new energy. There's a bit of a, there's some green shoots you might might call them, where there are some local organisations. You may have heard of the Stove in Dumfries, which is doing some very interesting things with young people, getting them involved in town centre development, uh, putting an emphasis on cult, art and culture and creative. Uh, creative activities to encourage them to express themselves and, and be engaged with what's happening in their own lives. So I think there's a lot more we could do, not just about education, but about creating the kind of place that young people want to live in. You, you've probably heard the, about millennials. We, we talk a lot about millennials in my office because apparently they're very different to baby boomers. Um, and uh, I, I make no um, comment on that round the table on who might be a baby boomer, but certainly managers tend to be baby boomers and young people coming into the workplace tend to be millennials. And the key difference, I I'm told, is that baby boomers are, uh, don't really have an interest in work-life balance. Um, the, the, we just work, work, work. The middle generation X are interested in work-life balance and it's, it's the millennials, the youngest group coming into the workplace that are interested in life work balance and they want to place as much attention on the quality of their life around work as they do on work and I think we have a fabulous environment to offer young people and if we can pull to knit together some of the strengths around the, the natural environment the art and culture of the area and the, the job opportunities then we could get more to stay. John, John can I bring, just bring in Maureen yes, she's got a thank supplementary. Thank you very much. Maureen. Yeah, clearly there's been a, a huge increase in the number of apprenticeships across Scotland. Do you have the figures for uh, the south of Scotland and are they keeping up with the, the trends in other parts of Scotland? Uh, Margaret, would you like to...? to... Well, I sit on the, um, the local skills um, <coughs> board and we are putting a concerted effort in. The problem again um, is the bigger firms can take on the apprentices but the smaller one- and two-man businesses are really struggling. So what we've been looking at is shared apprentices, making opportunities available there, working with the college to make sure that the opportunities in the college fit with what the needs are of the businesses. We work very closely with the Chamber of Commerce. They're actually a member of our chamber, which I find amusing, but they're, they're, they're excellent. And over the last couple of years, we've been able to tap into leader funding. And um, we've managed to get 75 young people that would never have managed on their own. Well, they maybe would have, but their chances would have been from deprived areas back into full-time employment. And that's been something that we've been very proud of and would like to do more of it. But there's more to be done on... Um, apprenticeships because the transport issues are, are another 
problem in our area. But I do hope that this agency um, lets them reach their potential because it's super to see them when they go into their first job. Okay. Um, we, we may move on to the next question, which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, We've spoken quite a lot about um, Scottish Enterprise and um, various people have mentioned uh, the two local authorities, colleges, Skills Development Scotland. I just want to drill down into those organisations a little bit more and get your um, experiences and perceptions of the current level of business and skills support that these organisations offer, how they work together. You mentioned the Chamber of Commerce and what role you see for Scottish Enterprise going forward in, in working with the new enterprise agency. Who'd like to start off on that? Everyone's looking away. That's dangerous. I, uh, Norma, uh, no, Margaret, you sort of looked at me. So I'll let you start off and then I'll give everyone a chance on that one. I do think that, again, it has to be not more of the same. We really need this new enterprise agency to, to actually work with the place, with the communities, and get down there and work with the chambers of commerce, with the third set, making sure that businesses are engaged, because at the moment they're quite disenfranchised, a lot of them. And through community planning, make links in that way as well. But we... Um, Skills Development Scotland have been a brilliant ally of ours for the last um, three years. We've worked very closely with them. It was a shame when they cut the 50% that we could get for access into training, mind you, but uh, that's another story. But these are small, these sound small things, but in a rural area where things are hard, we've so many part-time jobs and jobs that don't offer real progression that anything that can be added to that brings real value and that's what we want to see is a real chance for our communities. Matt, do you want to...? Yeah, um, I, I think the local authorities, Skills Development Scotland and the colleges and the universities actually that, that down there as well in terms of University West of Scotland and uh, I think Harriet Water in the, in the borders too all do tremendous work, you know, in terms of drive, trying to drive economic development, economic growth. If you look at the regional schools, work that SDS do in the south of Scotland and elsewhere in Scotland, it's all very positive. Likewise, the local authorities, local economic development teams try and drive forward the areas that, that they wish to in the colleges and, and universities try and support research and development as well as a skill base for the area. I, I think the beauty is of the new agency, it connects all that. And I think that's what the region and area of the south of Scotland has missed over that period is that focal point of an agency like High, and, and I don't want to compare the south to Highlands and Islands, I know they're different in terms of makeup, but it does do that, it pulls together the sum of its parts and the sum of its assets that we have in the south of Scotland and the other one that we've missed from there is business and that's the critical element of this we can talk about SDS, local authorities and X, Y, and Z, but if we do not have the business base working with the new agency, it will not work and it will not move forward because it will be agencies speaking to agencies but not speaking to businesses about what they need to drive it forward. So part of that needs to be a clear, consistent business voice that doesn't just represent the region but represents it out with the region too. Norma, would you like to come in on that? I think Margaret made a very important point, uh, which I would want to um, emphasise, which is that we, we can't have more of the same. And this is in particularly in response to you, your question. And I think if we were going to um, be um, honest about the, the role of Scottish Enterprise and the two local authorities in this area, we would have to ask the question, why after decades of working at this, have their strategies not worked? Because they haven't, in, in many respects, given that more young people are leaving, that it is very difficult to recruit, and I speak from personal experience, it's very difficult to recruit to particularly middle-level middle jobs, middle managers, and not so much at the, the, the beginning of a career, but into the middle. It's very difficult to get people off of quality and experience in the south of Scotland. So uh, that would be 
some, I would be suggesting some hard questions asked. But if I could add on to that, again, particularly with rela in relation to the third sector, I would look, be looking to the new agency to, uh, for some innovative uh, ideas on how to use the third sector to encourage young people, and not, just, not only young people, um, some older people as well, to retrain and to take advantage of the career opportunities that there are in the third sector using modern apprenticeships. I think the sharing idea is a really good one, um, along with uh, using Community Jobs Scotland, getting graduate uh, career paths through the third sector. We could be looking at lots of different ways of encouraging those. Um, just before I ask Gary for his comments, I, I was reading through your evidence, Gary, and, and, and something really sort of flicked out at me, which was, and I, and I quote it, evidence gathered during the Enterprise and Skills Review highlighted that businesses accessing support services often felt a particular product was being pushed at them rather than assistance that would address their specific circumstances. I mean, you obviously feel that that's an issue. Do you feel that the bill um, will give the new enterprise agency uh, the ability to develop specific products for specific businesses? And how do you see that being developed? And do you feel that there should be a disclosed plan annually uh, to allow that to, to be shown what they're doing? Quite a complex question, but you've raised it, so yeah. I'm assuming you're ready for it. Yeah, the, 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 the bill itself is very wide in general in terms of its, uh, in terms of its nature. So uh, I suppose to that extent it does give it the power, uh, give the enterprise agency the power to do those, those kinds of things. I think to link that to, to probably the previous two questions as well, um, uh, it, 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 the enterprise agency needs not to duplicate stuff that is already happening. It needs to enhance it. Um, it needs to look at the demographics of businesses and people in the area. And to come back to the, the skills question that Maureen Watt raised, um, it needs to recognise that there are so many self-employed people in the borders and in Fries and Galloway who are currently prevented from taking on an apprentice. So could we do something about that to make sure that there's more opportunities for apprenticeships there? Um, the, 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 the rules and the, the, the finance that is currently there prevent people from taking on older apprentices to the same extent that they're able to take on younger apprentices. So is there something we can do there with the likes of SDS to help enhance the availability of older age 25 plus apprenticeships to allow people to retrain in these ways? So those are the kinds of opportunities we would like to see the enterprise agency bring to the table. Um, Yes, the bill is sufficiently wide to allow that to happen. Should there be um, annualised business plans? Well, yes, there should be a business plan. They need to set out a clear direction uh, in terms of where they're going. They need to, as Matt has said, engage properly with the local business community to enable that to happen. Um, and it's probably not sufficient just to rely on uh, a board to do that. They need greater connectivity into the heart of small businesses right across uh, the borders and the Fries and Galloway to enable them to get that kind of intelligence which would lead them to provide the services that businesses need. And that comes back to the question you raised about our submission, which is we've certainly, when we've been looking at the Enterprise and Skills Review, when we've been looking at um, uh, the review of, of, of Business Gateway conducted um, by, by another um, uh, committee in, in this parliament, um, <laughs> A lot of the feedback we get coming back is, well, I'm getting offered support, but it's not exactly what I need, or it's not what I need right now. And how do we need, or how do we ensure that a new agency can help businesses receive the support they need when they need it, not maybe support that they don't need at the wrong time, uh, or support that they do need at the wrong time, or support that they don't need at the right time. How do we get the support that they need to them in time? And there's big challenges in how we do that, because... Um, the delivery agencies across the south of Scotland don't have a huge number of staff looking at Business Gateway, for example. Um, presumably, the new agency will be sufficiently staffed to do this, but then there's questions over... We've talked about the difficulty in recruiting. How do we recruit to staff this new agency? And there's huge opportunities there for, for, for local people either to stay in the area or come back to the area. But there's big challenges in, in, in keeping that, uh, bringing that agency together in terms of staff as well. 
OK, thank you. We're going to move on to the next question, which is Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, I, I feel maybe I should have asked this question at the very beginning, but I'd like to, to take a step back and just ask some more fundamental questions around the creation of, uh, of the agency. Um, first of all, I mean, why does the panel think, uh, given that there already is uh, an enterprise agency that covers Scotland outside of Highlands and Islands, that there is a dedicated need for a South of Scotland enterprise agency? What, what is going wrong with how things are currently delivered? And what is the problem that we're trying to address by the creation of the new agency? I think people for many years have suggested that the economy of the south of Scotland is different to the bulk of the rest of Scotland. It's different to the central belt of Scotland. It's different to Fife, Tayside or the northeast of Scotland. It's a very different area. See, it's different even from certainly, you know, parts of Ayrshire, Lanarkshire as well. So... <sighs> different, sorry, if I could press. Well, it, it's a very rural uh, economy. Um, it's very reliant on small businesses and the self-employed uh, in a way that, that a lot of those central belt areas are not. I mean, I mentioned the example earlier of, of, of West Lothian, relatively rural but central belt. Only 25% of the employment comes from small businesses, about 50% of employment from big businesses. In the borders, for example, that's different, and it's pretty much the case across the south. Um, you don't have that, even I suppose the differential between that and the north of Scotland is you don't have that, that sort of economic boom that, that has been in Inverness over the past few years. It's done relatively well, uh, but the rest of the Highlands maybe have struggled to keep pace with it, but have that as a, as a nexus there in the centre of Highlands and Islands. Um, the south of Scotland doesn't really have that. Its economy is very different. The borders... Um, quite reliant on, on Edinburgh, greater connectivity now into Edinburgh, hopefully better connectivity coming to the south of the border as well, either Newcastle uh, and or Carlisle, maybe through the, the Borderlands uh, inclusive growth deal. Um, Dumfries and Galloway, big towns at opposite ends of a very big uh, area, a big council area. Um, Dumfries, to some extent looking north, to some extent looking south. Stranraer, quite a distance away from Dumfries, maybe more in common with, with the southern part of Ayrshire, certainly closer to it in terms of, of, of time. But it's a very different part of the economy. It's very reliant on agriculture, very reliant, certainly Dumfries and Galloway, on forestry. Big industries there that we don't, can't probably put enough focus on at a national level. So Scottish enterprises that had a historically fairly small footprint in the south, um, I think, Two, three hundred, maybe maximum interventions uh, there in any one year. Um, that's not a lot compared to the rest of the country. So certainly, we would argue that this uh, new agency gives us an opportunity to recognise those differences, to celebrate those differences, and try and make sure that the south of Scotland gets the best possible advantage, and the businesses in the south of Scotland get the best possible advantage from government support. Thank you, Norma, and then I'm going to bring in Matt. So Norma. Yes, just to add to what Gary said, I think uh, the, the Dumfries and Galloway certainly has a very contained economy as well. Where, and we know this from the impact of foot and mouth disease in 2001, when of, uh, although the direct impact was on agriculture, virtually every aspect of the economy was affected by, by the loss and, and the impact on the, on the farming community. It affected tourism, it affected the... Uh, the, the secondary, the service sector that, that agriculture uh, buys into, and the, the whole economy, it felt at the time as if it were imploding, and it took us several years to recover from it. So there's a there's a interconnectedness about the economy that it is uh, particular to the south of Scotland that is is not the case in other parts of Scotland, with the exception of probably of Highlands and Islands. And the other point I would make about the nature of the economy and what, how it is different is that the, the deprivation in Dumfries and Galloway is very difficult to identify. We do know that 80% of the people who live in uh, formally defined uh, deprivation do not live in the top 15% SIMD areas where we keep targeting our resources. And I, I, I've, I dare say that Scottish Enterprise has done the same. We, we 
which is not to say that those areas in uh, like uh, Upper Nithsdale and over in Stranraer that they're not in need, but there is a lot of need that does not appear in those top 15%, and we have to find ways of being more adept at identifying need and then targeting it. And that's what a South of Scotland agency, I hope, would be able to take a leadership role in enabling and facilitating. Matt, before we bring you in, I might ask Jamie to ask his next question so, so that you could answer that as well. Sure, thank you, Convener. And, and uh, because I'm keen to hear everyone's view, maybe we could keep the answers succinct so I can get through some of the questions. Um, uh, I mean, I guess this follows on from my original point about why there should be a dedicated agency. You'll, you'll be aware that there is some debate around what constitutes the South. Uh, and obviously, the government has, has gone down the road of choosing the two local authorities, which it feels make up the South. One could argue anything South of the Central Belt is the South, certainly from a parliamentary point of view. The South region is, incorporates other areas. What makes you think that... Uh, this uh, agency's focus on uh, Dumfries and Galloway and the borders, uh, whilst it is clear there is a need for it, what will that do uh, for those surrounding areas which fall between the gap of existing agency and no new agency? And, and what is so different about, say, you know, Kelso or Selkirk that, that is so different from Mabel or Dorai in North Ayrshire, where they have similar economic problems? Matt. Thanks for that one. Uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, I know. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, how do you find any place? How do you find place? And I think that's what you're getting to. Is you know, place could be local to someone's village. It could be local to a city. It could be a region in itself. And and it, there's defined boundaries are hard to to mention and secure. I think what we have they've done via the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency say actually there's two local forests right next to the border. That is the South. How that's been come to in the criteria that has achieved that. I'm unsure of, and I can't comment. That's probably more to the politicians and the policy makers that have suggested that's the case. So I can't give you a definitive answer as to why that, that is the South or not. Going back to the first question, and I'll keep this succinct and brief as well, is the agency is that recognition of those unique challenges and opportunities, and we shouldn't forget that bit of the South of Scotland in terms of where we're trying to drive forward. We spent a lot of time focusing on the negatives of the South of Scotland, but actually there's some tremendous positives around some of the new industries that are created there and creative industries, textiles, renewables, that we actually need to really latch onto. And that placemaking approach allows us to achieve that probably easier than a, a wider, more national agency that would, might not be as nimble and as effective and agile to get into these things, but they still offer the opportunity, Scottish Enterprise, because they link you into those bigger opportunities that exist as well out with the region. So the age, as I go back to I said earlier, the South of Scotland agency working in, in its own autonomous way, but with a link into Scottish Enterprise to drive other aspects of its economic needs is the way and shape things should go forward. And I think that's what the bill is aimed at trying to achieve and, and move forward. Um, I think I'll stop there because you asked for succinctness and brevity. So, there you go. thank you, Ma Margaret. Do you want to, to add anything brief, briefly? I just to that? think that the borders is well for me. I can only speak for that. I came from Midlothian, and it was much more a mining area, so they had a much more community in there. The borders, it, it still is. If you go to Hoyk and you come out of it, they'll say it's a day out of Hoyk, it's a day wasted. So you're, you're up against that kind of mentality at times. I would like to see the whole of Scot the south of Scotland involved in it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't worry me one bit. I'd like to see us all get tapped into what I see as a real innovation and opportunity. But if you walk down the streets in our small towns at the moment, most of the shops are closing. So we really need to find a way of getting this back to a level that probably were when the mills were going but have gone completely and just give some hope. We've got so many families now that are third and fourth generation that have never worked. And I think that, that speaks volumes. I don't know if it answers your question properly, but I think Ayrshire and that, they still had, they could tap into regeneration from the coal fields and things. We haven't had that to the degree that we would need to get us back to a level playing field with the rest of Scotland. I, I think just before, perhaps before others in, intervene, uh, I, I think uh, that's, that's a, a very good point, but I think the point that people are making is that this, the 
council areas that are joining the two that have been chosen to participate in the agency and will ultimately benefit from the activities of the agency will be precluded from activities and, and including financial intervention and I think there is just a, a wider question as to you know what will, will those neighboring towns which are very similar in nature and culturally and economically uh, be looking across across the border into neighbouring council areas and wondering why they're not getting the same level of support. And uh, again, it's not a criticism of the new agency, it's just an observation. I totally agree with you and I would be shouting out for the same for them as well, okay. to be Thank honest. You. Jamie, I, I fear that may be a, a, a question that the Minister needs to pick up on when sure. he comes in to, to give evidence and I'm sure it will be relayed back to him. Can we move on to uh, the, the next question, which is from Peter? Chapman, Peter. Yeah, thanks, convener, and, and good morning, folks. I mean, uh, my, my question is, is about the process leading up to the legislation. Do you feel that you and your organisation that you represent and other uh, uh, businesses and third sector organisations were sufficiently involved in the consultation process leading up to the, to the, pl the planning stages of the, and, and where we've got to with the bill? Do you think the, 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 the consultation was correct and wide enough? and has been reflected in, in what you see in the bill? And so the answer could be a simple yes, and, and, <laughs> and, if, and, and if the answer's no, don't hold back. Uh, I'm going to let Matt start and then, then Margaret. Matt. Uh, yes, it's, <laughs> it's a simple <laughs> answer to that. And I'd very, very quickly add to that, though. I mean, yes, in terms of it wasn't just sending out a consultation that you write into. I think there was about... 50, 60 meetings that uh, Russell Groves and Rob Dixon did around various different towns and villages in the south of Scotland, which is magnificent. And, and I believe there was high turnout at them all, and I believe there was a lot of, uh, a lot of feedback, shall we say, positive and negative and challenging uh, about the opportunities that, that are part of the SOSEP uh, aims of focus going forward, we hope. So, yeah, I thought it was a fantastic consultation exercise. Very good. I, I fear the, an the next answer may not be the same. Margaret? Definitely not. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I go so far to say is that we're having our first real meeting with SOSEP on the, in January to see where we sit and fit within this. The local authority, Rob Dixon, has, has always been a, a great ally, um, but on this side of it, I feel, I feel we could have contributed a lot more and given a lot more if we were asked there's the, I'm just going to say no more on that. Okay, I'm, I'm to going to go back to borders. <laughs> I'm going to bring in briefly Colin and then allow Norma and Gary to answer that. But Colin, it, it might be a point that the panel might want to make after that we've answered that question. But um, Margaret mentioned SOSEP and so did Matt. As well as the consultation on the development of the bill, do you think that you've been actively involved in the working of SOSEP, which is the, obviously the agency which is in place at the moment? Um, that has a, a budget of £10 million. I mean, what say have you had in how that, that partnership actually spends that £10 million? Because obviously that's seen as the, the, the precursor to the new agency. Have you been involved in the work of the new partnership? Margaret, I'll let you come back briefly on that and then move to Norma. Definitely not. I would love to have been. Um, we certainly would have made... Um, uh, I don't want to be negative because it is a big area and they've got to cover it, but I do think we had a, we had a part to play and if we'd asked, if we'd been involved, we could have contributed a lot more and we will do moving forward. I can trust you, tell you that. Norma, do you want to come in there? Y yes, thank you. Um, certainly, um, I was, I've been invited to sit on the, one of the themed communities, the community's theme group, which is a subgroup of the uh, executive part of the, of the structure and uh, frankly it's only because I'm involved in that that I've actually managed to get to grips with what the structure is and uh, to some extent the processes that are being used to decide how the uh, nine million pounds is being spent. Um, I think I, I could reflect the wider concern in the third sector that there is a, a lack of, uh, it, it perce it's perceived as a lack of transparency about decision making, accountabilities and so on. I think it probably is in, in reality um, inadequate communication about what's, 
what's going on. Of course, transparency and communication are closely linked. But anyway, in short, I think a better communication strategy on what's happening now would help considerably to uh, herald the arrival of the new agency when it comes along. If we could start to improve that, I think it would be welcomed more positively. Gary, do you want to give a brief answer on that? Yes, uh, there's been a huge volume of consultation on this and we've certainly been, been party to that. Um, I think going forward it's about the quality rather than the volume um, and that's why I made the point earlier about <clears throat> yes, the organisation has to get going um, you know, once the parliamentary process has, has moved on, get a chairman in place, get a board in place, but it needs to go further than that and it needs to engage with all of these groups and businesses right across the south of Scotland to ensure that its direction matches that of the local economy. Which perfectly leads to Peter's next question, surprisingly. Well, I'm, I just would comment, it, it's quite uh, stark, the difference between Matt's answer and partly Gary's answer to, to Margaret's answer. There's obviously, there's obviously a, some sort of disconnect there between some of the various organisations, and I'll just, leave, I'll just park that there. But my, my next question is, uh, there's been some debate as to where the, the, the headquarters of the new agency should be and whether there should be a co-location, maybe two uh, locations uh, to, to cover the, the geographical uh, issues that there, there are in, in the two areas. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are, because the, the, the Scottish ministers will decide where the, the, the headquarters will be and whether there will be one or two locations. What, what are your thoughts on, on that issue, uh, aspect of the, the uh, new agency going forward? We certainly think if... Uh, if, if hold if, on, if, Gary. If, can I, can I, I was, I was, Norma was certainly indicating before you, so <laughs> I'll let Norma come in and, uh, and then come to you, Gary. Yes, uh, needless to say, the subject of much discussion locally. Um, and it would be tempting, I'm, I'm based in Dumfries, and it would be tempting, I think, for me to say it should be in Dumfries, of course. And uh, there are several options, which no doubt have been discussed. However, I think at this point, um, uh, for me, a more important question is that how do we decide where the location, how can we decide where the location of this uh, organisation should be before we're really clear on its remit? And its, and its powers and its objectives. And I'm just slightly concerned about putting, uh, making decisions about form, if you like, before we're really clear on function. And, and I think I would make the same comment, uh, I don't know if I'm going to, we're going to be asked about the, the staffing levels, but I, I, I nearly fell off my chair when I read the, the figure of 125 to 175 uh, people in, uh, intended to be employed, um, again, that, it seems to me that you can't make the decision about how many people are going to be employed and who's going to be employed until you've got a clearer understanding of what it is you want this organisation to do. Gary, Gary and then Matt. Thoughts on whether it should be one or two locations? I think, it, well, it, it, there's certainly some good arguments to be made for having uh, several bases across this vast region. We perhaps haven't emphasised the sheer scale of things. And the needs of Stranraer are quite different to Hoyk and Dumfries and Eyemouth and all the rest of it. Uh, I think there's also a good case for co-location with other organisations yeah. with, who also have a South of Scotland remit. So, so not one week in one ple place and oh. one week in another. Sorry, <laughs> Gary and, 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 and Matt. Yeah, um, co-location has, has to be the answer here. The, the, um, there is a commonality across the South of Scotland, but... Um, there is enough diversity, you know, looking at the borders, uh, every town is different, every town has its own individual character, um, and the same can be said for, for, for Dumfries and Galloway as well. Um, you know, if, if you put something in Dumfries, people in Stranraer would complain that it's a four-hour round trip to, 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 to get there. And, you know, they'd be right. In this day and age, does it really matter uh, where we, we have a, a, a nominal headquarters? Um, I dare say there will be a nominal headquarters, but this needs to exist in communities right across the borders from west to east, from north to south. Um, and it needs to be there where businesses need it, when businesses need it. Um, and the idea of one single headquarters just 
doesn't make sense in this, this day and age. It needs to be co-located. If it's to integrate with the functions of Skills Development Scotland, the local councils, Business Gateway, Scottish Enterprise, it needs to be co-located uh, with these organisations. Matt, well, br briefly, and then we're going to move on to the next question. Yeah, it's probably similar to, to what everyone else, uh, else has said. The, the location of how you deliver a service needs to be based on the needs of that particular, where the highest need or the highest support need is for it to, to be. That's how any service is generally delivered. But we shouldn't just look at delivering services as bricks and mortar in terms of the world's changing. We're moving into a digital economy. We're, we're looking at, uh, we all access services in, in a digital format, all of us. And, and again, I think the new South of Scotland agency needs to play to that, to cover that vast vast areas we've already mentioned uh, to support people and sometimes people want the support virtually and not actually want it face to face so we need to think that through a bit clearly i think some of this comes back to what the south is and ensuring that we have a vision a mission for the south that is agreed upon across those areas in the south of scotland and once you have that Location still, be, still is an issue, and I get the sensitivities around it, but it's less of an issue because people believe in the south of Scotland. They believe in it like it's the Highlands and Islands enterprise as well. The other part of that is that there are a number of assets that we have in the south where there's opportunities to co-locate with SDS or old Scottish enterprise buildings, and we should be looking at bringing those assets back into play because that in itself creates further economic development across those local communities as well. So what I'm saying, need... Let's not just be focused on bricks and mortar, use the digital economy, look to create a vision for the South, which lessens the sensitivities around where it's actually placed as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I, I'd just say that I've tried to give everyone a chance to enter in an answer on each of them. I may have to be a little bit tighter on, on, on the next section because we're halfway through the questions um, and, and very close to the full time that we'd allocated. But I would, it's very important we continue this. So, Colin, if you'd like to head off on the next question. Thank you, Convener. I note you said that just before my contribution. Thank you for that. I'm not saying you're verbose, <laughs> Colin. But <laughs> Good morning to the panel. The bill proposes that the board of the new agency should be appointed by government ministers. Do you think that's the right approach? And how do you ensure that the board actually has the experience and skills that properly reflect the stakeholders in the south of Scotland? And I suppose, crucially, how do you make that board, and a point that Margaret made earlier, how do you make that board accountable to the south of Scotland and not just accountable to government ministers? Who'd like to head off on that? Ma Margaret, would you like to...? OK, well... The government ministers, um, I, I do trust them to, to make that decision, but they, they can't make that without totally discussing that with the area and making um, a real effort to get it right. Ideally, it would be done in a much lower level, but you know we are where we are. And I've never had a problem working with ministers in the past, so... I, I'm not really worried about that. I think it's more that we get the right people involved in, on that board and it covers across the whole of the, the region. We're not just looking at the, the same old... I keep saying this, the same old, same old. We really need to get the quality and to get it right this, for the, the future of the south of Scotland. Gary, do you want to, to chip on that? Yeah, I mean, really just to... to... <sighs> You know, yes, boards boards are appointed. I would hope that uh, the the advice upon which appointments are made is sound. Uh, that local knowledge is is very much part of it, and that the overall um, board, once it's there, will reflect um, the demographics and, uh, and and the nature of of, of business and, and community across the south of Scotland. But I do think it does need to go beyond the board, and it needs to have a defined connectivity into businesses and communities right across. So it can't rely exclusively on the board. The board should be there. It should be knowledgeable. Um, it should be appointed on a, on a, 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 a bit the basis of, of, of ability. It should reflect the local needs. But there must also be that link into communities and businesses across the area, particularly, as you would expect me to say, smaller businesses, because they do make up such a huge part of the south of Scotland economy. 
Can I just touch on that? What would the mechanism be to achieve that then? Because the bill doesn't cover that at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's something that's not within uh, the, the, the bill itself, and I'm not sure what the formal mechanism would look like if there was a formal mechanism for that, but it would need to have connectivity in some way um, uh, to reflect the, the, the huge geography uh, and the huge range of businesses you have. I don't know what that looks like, but it needs to be there somehow. Okay. Colin, do you want to... No, I don't hear the rest of the panel. Before we... Well, Colin, I, it, I can't give everyone the chance to Sorry. do every, every question, well, as I've said. Norma, I'm happy to bring you in, but... If, if I can just maybe a little bit, bit helpful, then, if, if, if um, Gary has mentioned specifically the role of businesses into that new board, into that new agency, maybe Norma and Margaret can talk about how they see, in Norma's case, the third sector being involved in the activities of the new agency, and maybe, Margaret, how would you see social enterprise being involved in the activities of, of the new agency? Because, obviously, this will be a new forum for, for, for your sectors. Uh, Norma, you, if you'd like to start off and yep. then bring... In, in terms of mechanisms it, uh, for making sure that uh, the minister has... the ministerial process has uh, influence from, from the local level, uh, it seems to be that you, you've got the existing SOSEP structure, that there are some mechanisms in there that could be used for um, discussion and channelling views and influence. However, specifically about the third sector, um, I, I do have uh, quite a lot of concerns about this. There are 2,300 voluntary organisations in Dumfries and Galloway, and I suspect there'll be a, a, a similar number in Scottish borders. And, of course, we hope for uh, adequate representation at on the board from the third sector, but it seems to me, and I speak from some experience on this uh, uh, in different organisations, it's very hard to represent 2,300 organisations if you are one person. I don't necessarily have an answer to it, but I do think it's something that needs some careful consideration. Okay, Margaret, would you like to well, go? I, I totally agree with what Norm is saying there. Um, when I was recruited as the ambassador for disability from the UK government, it was a long and arduous process, but I felt we got we got there in the end. But I do think we need to make sure that all of the third sector, and especially social enterprise, I would say that, but I really do feel that that's a business, and it's driven by business. It's, it's just what it does with its profits that makes it different. And if we can be on there, we are actually a really good critical friend. We're that just now for the local authority, the NHS, and all our key partners, and I think we could do the same for the new agency. Do you have more? I think that's, that's me covered, yeah. All yeah. oh, right. OK, sorry, I thought you had more questions. I could come up with more if you wish, convener. No, I'm, 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 I'm sure you could, uh, Colin. John, the next question is from yours. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I mean, there has been some mention already of small businesses and attracting them, and Business Gateway, in fact, was mentioned, and... a. I am on the Economy Committee, so we are also doing a study of Business Gateway at the moment. And one of the things we've found in both SE areas, Scottish Enterprise and HIE areas, is that sometimes Business Gateway and SE or HIE work together quite well, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes there's overlaps and the same business is getting different help from both. More often, there's a gap in the middle and HIE don't help. Business Gateway don't help, Scottish Enterprise don't help, and Business Gateway don't help. Do you think we should be putting something in the legislation to, to try and make this a bit more joined up, or is it just impossible to help every business? There seems to be some uh, nods of agreement. So, so Norma, and then on to Gary, and I'll pick up anyone else who, who wants to come in. I think a, a formal clarity on roles and responsibilities uh, of all the agencies um, would be extremely helpful, uh, not necessarily removing any, but make, being absolutely clear about what each organisation is responsible for and also how they um, are, agree to work together, some, some kind of uh, memorandum of understanding. And I would, I would say this, but I think you could add into the mix the third sector interfaces and the agencies like Scottish, uh, Scottish Enterprise Network, SEN and Firstport, who also have a role in developing social and community enterprises. And I think it would be extremely helpful if the bill could give some formal recognition to, uh, and clarity to, uh, to all these different uh, organisations and what they do. Gary, followed by Matt. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, in terms of uh, 
the new organisations, how it relates to other um, bodies which provide services. Um, I'm not sure it has to be in the bill. It would certainly have to be in the, 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 the plan of the organisation, which we'd hope to see come forward fairly quickly. Um, it, it, it is important they talk to each other. It is important, as I've said before, that, they, that the new organisation delivers additionality. Um, for a business going for support, it's important they have that, that one-stop shop that you know, has been talked about in the, the business gateway debate as well. Um, because to them, the structure doesn't matter. They just want help when they need it, you know, at, the, at the point that they require it. So they need to be able to go to the new agency or go to any part of um, economic support in the south of Scotland and be able to get that full range of services wherever they go to. If they pop into the local office, if they ring the number, if they go to the website, all that, that support should be there, whether it comes from Business Gateway, whether it comes from South of Scotland Enterprise, whether it comes from Scottish Enterprise, whether it comes from SDS. Uh, they need that support there and then, and we're looking for South of Scotland Enterprise to provide that additionality to ensure a better service for local businesses. We've got an opportunity to get it right in the South of Scotland. It has been patchy in terms of business gateway in the rest of the country. There's areas where it works brilliantly. There's areas where it doesn't work so well. This is an opportunity to get it right in the south of Scotland. I mean, if I just come back to you before anyone else comes in. Um, I mean, Scottish Enterprise, as I understand it, focus on growth and on certain sectors. So you could have a real growth business in, in retail and Scottish Enterprise wouldn't look at you. Yeah. Or in international recruitment uh, and Scottish Enterprise wouldn't look at you because you're in the wrong sector. Mm -hmm. Should that also apply to the South of Scotland enterprise? I think South of Scotland, in terms of account management, should be able to define its own sectors um, and should be able to support accordingly. Even some of the key sectors, for example, tourism, I think there's a handful of businesses ac across the South of Scotland who are supported <coughs> by SE on an account managed basis. This is an opportunity for support to be given to a wider range of businesses as reflected by the local business demographic. Mr Langshaw. Um, I think it goes back, back to what I said earlier. It's about com complementarity of support and no wrong door approach. So if you're a business in the south of Scotland and you walk through the new agency's doors and they can support you on whether it's a growth sector, whether it's business support, that's what they should do. And, and, and that, if that's within their remit, that's what they should do. However, if it's not, they should obviously give you guidance and support to signpost you to the likes of Scottish Enterprise, to the likes of SDS and to the likes of the other agencies that are within the area in an aligned approach. The danger if we get too caught, I think, in this is my remit, this is your remit and that's this remit, is people get lost in the cracks quite quickly. So it needs to be collaborative in terms of no wrong door approach to move things forward. The other area I'm quite interested in as well is how do we connect even further beyond those agencies as well into areas like things like UK Industrial Strategy, Scottish National Investment Bank, which really drive investment into some of the great opportunities that exist in, in, in the region too. And that's another focus that I don't think we've picked up yet uh, as part of this conversation, it's probably not for now. But my point being is, I don't think we can be too rigid in people's remits and responsibilities, but we do need that, and it's not even a word complementarity, we need that complement of services where people can be signposted and pushed towards because there's better support available and it's within their remit and expertise at Scottish Enterprise or SDS or others. Margaret, do you want to come in on that? Well, I just, I totally agree with what, what you've said there, Matt, because we certainly, the organisations that we've started up, we, we do bring Business Gateway in for some support and uh, not so much for Scottish Enterprise, but that's because of size and things. But I think that's what we need to do. Is, uh, there's no wrong approach to this. We just have to make sure that whoever is best placed to, to offer the support, that, that that's made to the businesses when they're starting up and we can get, or when they're looking to grow, which is my real hope that we'll get some real growth. Okay. Um, and the other area I wanted to ask about was attracting investment into the area. Um, now, I mean, is that something you actually want? Do you think we want in the south of Scotland to have more bigger branches of international organisations? Because I think you've had a bad experience with pennies. And if you put 400 jobs all in the one factory, that sounds a bit like putting all your eggs in the one basket. I mean, 
is that something that the agency should be doing? Uh, or would you just rather that we kept lots of small businesses and helped them do, do better? And business about me includes social enterprise. Who'd like to... Sorry, I've started with you a couple of times. I'm going to go to Matt and then come to you, Norma. Um, business is good for, for an area where it's indigenous and scale up in terms of providing jobs and economic growth, whether that's a, a micro business, whether that's a 10 person business, or whether that's a thousand person business in an area. So the agency should be focusing on how it can support driving high quality, fair work jobs into the region and moving forward, as well as supporting those indi indigenous businesses that wish to scale up as well. In terms of investment, to support any of that, though, it needs investment in infrastructure, yeah. whether that's transport infrastructure, roads, railways, etc. as well. So there's a role for both government and private and public sector to support investment too, to allow those opportunities to attract maybe a, a, a global national entity, but also to allow the scale up of businesses within that area too. So I think it's twofold. The focus should be, I'm not saying we should just run after every international business, but would you come if you didn't think there were skills in the area, that there weren't the transport links, etc. as well. So I don't think we can just see the attraction of large corporates in isolation from the other needs of the area and what needs investment in terms of infrastructure as well because that allows your indigenous businesses to grow support go further and connectivity is a I mean, digital connectivity is part of that infrastructure investment too Thank you. norma yes i think the short answer is yes we need both i think this is an opportunity for the new agency to show leadership i think any success in this will depend on the new, the new organisation, the new agency, developing that close link with uh, the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise uh, and, and the other agencies that attract inward investment, making sure that the priorities for the, for the new South of Scotland economy or the emerging South of Scotland economy are known and understood at, those, at the national agency level. So that the, the, the priorities, which will keep changing as it grows, will be uh, known and understood so that the investment will, will come if it's uh, available. Do you think Scottish Enterprise have been more keen to get businesses into East Kilbride or Fife rather than, than forgotten about the South of Scotland? I, I think you, you have to judge Scottish Enterprise on their results. And the economy in the South of Scotland is clearly not flourishing. Okay. John, sorry, no, uh, Margaret, yes, Just sorry. Just one quick thing. I'm all for inward investment because I really think we do need to build on the infrastructure and I'm hoping the city region deal will benefit from that. But the one thing I don't want would be to see what's happened in the past is some investment comes in, organisations come in, they take the money and go, and then we're left to pick up the pieces. That's not the kind of investment I would want to see for my region. I'd like it to be sustainable and long-term and skills-based. Sorry. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, and the next question is from Richard Lyle. Richard. Yes, Margaret, you're, you're quite right, Margaret Simpson, in regard to sustainable and long-term. But last week, um, the bill team, the Scottish Government bill team, confirmed that the Government is not proposing to give South of Scotland Enterprise those powers, including compulsory purchase powers, powers to enter a land without permission, powers to require people to give information under penalty, penalty of criminal, criminal sanction for not providing it, and those powers are not being pursued for the South of Scotland Agency. Do you believe, and I, I'm sure you will, do you believe that the South of Scotland enterprise to work and to be successful and to drive forward what you have spoken about this morning, uh, the, the need for investment in the region, have the same powers as Scottish Enterprise and HIE, specifically compulsory purchase powers, powers to enter onto land, powers to require people to give uh, information, and in my view, full powers, not part powers, to start with. And I'm sure that's not a leading question. Who would like to go with that, Norma? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Why would you want to tie their hands in any way, give them all the powers they need? Matt? Um, I, 
can't really answer it, to be quite frank, because I've, I've not read that far, far, part of the bill itself. I, I can come back to you on it. I think, I think there's certainly different thought on it. That's what I'll say for now. But I'm sorry, like, I didn't. I think there's it. different thoughts on what should be in the bill in terms of those compulsory <laughs> purchase powers and etc. As well, have we got a position on that? We, we don't. But I can come back to you, Richard, after after the committee to suggest more. Uh, I've, I've not had people on the phone constantly asking that question, but uh, what I do think that the, the organisation needs is the ability to be agile. Uh, you know, we are facing a very uncertain economic period. Whatever happens south of the border today, um, we're going to be facing a, a, a very uncertain economic period and the new agency will be coming on stream uh, probably right in the middle of all that. So um, it needs to be agile, it needs to be able to deal with any economic shocks across the south of Scotland in a way that perhaps Scottish enterprise was slow to in the wake of the big recession of 2008 to 2009. Thank you. Richard, do you have any more questions? No, basically, you know, my, it's been my view in the, since we started looking at this bill, maybe a comment rather than a question, that, that we have to give you the full powers. You know, I, when I worked with the Royal Bank, I was in uh, uh, the Dumfries, Galloway and, and the Scottish Borders and basically know all the different towns that, 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 that you, you, you speak in. And they all have different needs. And Stranra has a, a need better than Dumfries. So really... Do you want something that's going to work rather than something that's just a sop? Everyone, everyone's that, nodding that, by the I think that. that's a yes. Jamie, you, you, you had a question, I think. Thank, thanks, Governor. Just to really follow on, it's, it's not necessarily around the powers that the agency should have, but I guess one of the complaints that we hear often from small businesses or medium-sized businesses access to working capital to grow their businesses, do you think this agency will have any additional resource in that respect, or will it just be a coordination role in terms of uh, existing government uh, bodies that are able to provide funds to businesses? Who'd like to head off on that? Norma. I think it absolutely has to have um, capital to invest, money to invest. I would be very concerned if the um, amount being spent on the running of the agency dwarfed the amount that it had to give out to uh, for business development and social enterprise development. Very important point. Margaret, do you? Totally agree with what Norm is saying. It doesn't need to be massive amounts, but a small amount can make a big difference, especially when you're trying... And it's about the support as well. But, yeah, combination. Matt. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Yeah, if it's got, um, you know, there's many pots of money out there that businesses can access. Some are maybe restricted to one type of business or another. Um, if this can help coordinate and ensure easy access to those funds and perhaps provide some additionality, again, I keep making that point about additionality, if it can do that, then that would be great. Um, fine. There's one final question I'd like to ask. As, as it's coming up to Christmas, we're all used to writing wish lists. Um, as I'm not in the government, I, I can't promise to deliver this one, but is there anything not included in the bill that the witnesses feel that they f that should be in the bill? And I'll give you all a chance to answer that, and you can add one thing on your wish, wish list if there is anything that you'd like to add. Who'd like to head off with that? Gary. Um, I, I don't think I would necessarily add anything to the, the bill itself. It is essentially a piece of, of enabling legislation uh, what we do want to see is uh, a plan. We want to be businesses in the, in, the, in the south of Scotland need to be part of the development of that plan, uh, and we want to see it as soon as possible. So the fact that, that there isn't mention of a plan and reviews within the bill, you don't think is necessarily that important? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think the bill is there to, to create the agency. It's a, it's a, it's a means to an end. Um, but obviously how the agency operates um, is something that, that uh, businesses across the area would, would want to clear say. OK, I'm going to work straight down the line, Matt. Yeah, uh, briefly following on from Gary, uh, I've said it before, uh, I don't think it's for the bill itself. I think the new agency needs a clear vision that people are behind, and including businesses themselves. Um, it needs outcomes attached to what operating plan that it comes up with around uh, economic growth, productivity, etc. that we've already discussed. Um, and it needs to look beyond the region. The danger is it just becomes too local in its thinking. And that's good at the start, but it needs to go past that and, and look at the opportunities beyond 
its boundaries. Okay. Margaret. I, I think everything that's been said, but I would make a plea for the third sector, especially my sector, to be involved. OK. Norma. Um, I'm not sure if it's for the bill. I think I would like it to be in the bill. Um, and that is a per capita approach to funding. I think if the agency were to be given uh, funding that relates to the, 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 the population, as I believe High have had, um, we've never had that before. And that would be a very good starting point. OK, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for, for coming in and giving evidence this morning on, on this important bill. So I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow you to depart. And committee members, if you could be back here in five minutes, ready to start the next agenda item. So I suspend the meeting. Thank you.
going to move on to agenda item two, which is the European Withdrawal Act 2018. There are seven notifications. We have received consent notifications in relation to seven UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. These cover common fisheries policy, common agricultural policy in trade in animals and related products. All these instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. All seven have been categorised by the Scottish Government in general as Category A, i.e. making minor or technical amendments. Six of the proposed SIs on the common agricultural policy could also be considered as Category B to the extent that the transition from the, UK, sorry, from the EU to a UK framework would be a major significant development. Are there any comments before I suggest possible outcomes? Uh, in relation to this. John, you want to make a comment? Um, thank you very much, Convener. Yeah, but, um, the phrase minor or technical is uh, dotted throughout these documents, and whilst on one level that's very correct, and whilst it is a, um, often the replacement of EU with the words UK, I think none, nonetheless many of these relate to very far-reaching implications. So I know we're going to come on to, to uh, um, some possible options, but I would certainly want, um, and I'm particularly looking at you know, things like the common agricultural payments and the trade in animals and related products, that we maintain a watching brief in these. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments? Jamie. Uh, just a brief one, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, the committee will note that two of the SIs are England-only instruments, and my question to the Scottish Government is whether uh, they will propose uh, uh, Scottish SSIs to reflect similar changes. Does anyone else have any comments? As, I, as I'm going to pass comment, I should declare an interest that I am a partner in, in a farming enterprise in Scotland. But the only comment I'm going to make is based on what Mr Finney said and what uh, Jamie Green said, is uh, I think it's appropriate for the committee to agree to write to the Scottish Government to confirm its content for the consent for the UK SIs to be referred to in the notifications to be given, but note a request for response from the Scottish Government on the wider policy matters identified. Is the committee agreed on that? OK, that is agreed. The next item on the agenda is a public petition. This petition, uh, the committee will consider the following petition, and that's PE1598 by Guy Lindley Adams on behalf of the Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland on protecting wild salmonoids from sea lice from Scottish salmon farms. The committee is invited to consider whether it wishes to take any further action in relation to the petition. Options include, yes, I'll come to you, uh, Mr Lyle, when I've done, given the options, is options to include closing the petition, given that the issues raised in the petition have been addressed in the salmon farming in Scotland inquiry, or taking, or we could agree to take any other action the committee considers appropriate. Mr Lyle, you'd like to make a comment? Yeah, I would agree with the first option, which says closing the petition, given that the issues raised in the petition have been fully and previously considered in the salmon farming in Scotland inquiry, which we've recently completed. Thank you. Does anyone have any other comments? So I said, oh, sorry, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. And uh, whilst I agree that this particular petition should be closed in light of the significant work the committee did on this issue, I still think it would be prudent for the committee to uh, think about during the course of the re remainder of the parliamentary term to uh, consider whether the recommendations given in the report have been implemented or taken on board by the government at some point before the end of the term. Okay. Does does anyone else have any comments? I, I, you know, I, I can take a, on board the comments you're making, but I don't remember us putting in a sunset clause. But uh, I'm I'm quite okay. relaxed about your comment. Um, so, in relation to this petition, it seems appropriate from the comments that we've had around the table that we, we write to the petitioner saying that we've closed this petition and informed the petition committee that we, we've done to. Um, so, if that's agreed, the committee will now move into private session. Um, so, that I therefore close the meeting.